democracy is an ongoing struggle. It demands steady leaders, people who willingly confront challenges, who empower others, people who are always learning and seeking change. More than ever, our nation and our world need people who can lead with integrity and civility. Now is the time to act. To ensure a brighter future for generations to come. And the La Follette School is ready to lead the way. Welcome everyone, both in person and online. I'm Susan Yaki, the director of the La Follette School of Public Affairs, and I'm delighted you could join us for tonight's conversation with New York Times columnist, David Brooks. I wanna take a moment to quickly tell you about the La Follette School, as well as to thank our sponsors for supporting tonight's event. The La Follette School of Public Affairs is the home for public policy research and teaching on UW-Madison's campus, and it's one of the top policy schools in the world. We educate graduate students in our master's programs, as well as UW-Madison undergraduate students in our new certificate in public policy program. We are also on the cusp of launching a new undergraduate certificate in health policy with our first class of students starting this spring. The school is experiencing tremendous growth, doubling the size of our faculty and almost tripling the number of students that we serve all within the last three years. Part of this growth has been funded by a $10 million investment in the school by former U.S. Senator Herb Cole, and we are so thankful for that gift. That generous in investment has changed the trajectory of the La Follette School, and it enables us to convene events like tonight, where we can contribute to thoughtful and civil dialogue around public policy issues and solutions. I also want to thank another sponsor and a new partner to the La Follette School, American Family Insurance, whose financial support has helped make this evening possible. American Family shares La Follette School's commitment to, to developing future leaders and to serving as a strong community leader and partner. American Family Chairman and CEO Jack Salzwedel is here tonight to introduce our speaker, so let me close by introducing you to Jack. Jack began his career at American Family Insurance in 1983 as a claims adjuster, and he rose through the ranks to become chairman and CEO in 2011. During his tenure, the company has transformed, adding new companies and distribution systems, and more than doubling in revenue and assets. The company has also expanded its commitment to the community with an emphasis on equity and inclusion efforts. The American Family Institute for Corporate and Social Impact was established in 2018, and AmFam hosts one of the top PGA Champions tournaments, which has raised more than $10 million for charities and delivered more than $70 million in local economic impact. Earlier this year, American Family announced its Free to Dream initiative, which is a $105 million commitment to addressing equity gaps in the United States. Jack serves our community on a number of boards, both in the co corporate and nonprofit sectors. And Jack and his wife, Sarah, have established the Salzwedel Family Foundation, and they have been leading community supporters of the United Way, American Family Children's Hospital, and other Wisconsin charities. So I'll close with a fun fact. Jack is a big social media advocate, and CEO.com recently named Jack the most engaged Fortune 500 CEO on Twitter. So let me introduce you to and turn this podium over to Jack Salzwedel. Jack. I have no idea where she found that. 
not a real badge of honor, but uh, it is what it is, I guess. So um, nice to see you tonight. And you know, there is a World Series game, so I just felt like I had to wear this mask uh, tonight. I've, I'm still mourning the loss uh, of the game for, by the Brewers, and I know David is a uh, Mets fan, so I think he's feeling a little bit the same way tonight. So, but it's it's, it's great to be here tonight, and even better to think about. Uh, our speaker tonight and about the program that we have. I'd like to first uh, give a couple thank yous first to all of you for keeping your masks up um, and adhering to the county safety protocols. It allows for us to have some of these in-person get togethers. And what do you think? It's great to get back together, isn't it? So, so thank you for that. I also wanna thank the folks at the La Follette School of Public Affairs for uh, sponsoring uh, the event the event tonight and that means uh, to everybody on that staff everybody at the school but in particular to to uh, Susan uh, who was up here just a minute ago uh, she's the director there and for all of her hard work in making not only tonight happen but everything that they do happen and, and at times it can be a thankless job I think uh, but I think a very rewarding one as well so could you give it up for Susan please one more time At, Amer at American Family, we're very privileged to uh, be a partner with the La Follette School and to sponsor the event tonight. And they've kept today's, uh, tonight's speaker very, very busy today. It's like he's been on a bit of a, a treadmill, I will tell you. Um, he started today at the Goodman Center, uh, ended up having lunch there, and uh, had interviews with local jur journalists there as well. Then attended a session at Governor Doyle's class at the La Follette School at a reception tonight and now uh, his time with us. So uh, I, I do wanna thank David for being on that treadmill and everything that he did uh, to get us here tonight. So it is my individual privilege and pleasure to introduce tonight's featured speaker, David Brooks. I have, I have, been, an, I have been an avid reader, as my wife knows, of David and his material for some time. Uh, he's been an op-ed columnist for the New York Times since September of 2003. He's served as an analyst on the PBS NewsHour, NPR's All Things Considered, and NBC's Meet the Press. He's authored five books and has one in the works right now, uh, all of which I've read and are just uh, tremendous. If you haven't had a chance to uh, read one of his books, please, please do that. Uh, David joined the Aspen Institute in 2018 to spearhead the Weave Project, aimed at bridging the differences that divide Americans and seeking out a compelling common ground. And isn't that important and pertinent to us today? Uh, David teaches at Yale University. He's a member of the American Academy of Arts and Sciences. He serves on the board of advisors of the University of Chicago's Institute of Politics, and he's a graduate of the University of Chicago, and he also serves on their board of trustees. There's so many accolades and career highlights that, that I could emphasize. I'm inspired by his work in helping to bring Americans together to find common ground. And I think that's the, the main thing that, uh, I th when I think of David, I think of that comment. This is an enormous need in our, in our country right now. And his ideas on this and many other uh, ideas are so relevant to us and the things that we're doing. He's devoting his time right now to topics and to audiences that he sees as opportunities for positive change. And that's what brought him to Madison and the school here today and tonight. So we are grateful to have him with us and excited for his comments. Please, well, please join me in welcoming David Brooks to Madison and the University of Wisconsin. Thank you, Jack, and we'll follow up on the insurance policy you just sold me backstage. Uh, <laughs> it's a pleasure to be here. My topic is politics and policy, and this is going to be an unusual speech about politics and policy, but I assure you it's about politics and policy at the deepest level. And I'm going to start by telling you three stories. The first is a, a story a woman told to me about six months ago, and she was 13, and she went to her first party, and she got horribly drunk. She got driven home, uh, and she got to the front porch, and she was so drunk she couldn't move. 
Her father, who was a big disciplinarian, came out the front door, saw her so drunk on the porch, and she expected him to scream at her, saying the things that she was already thinking in her head, which was, I'm bad, I'm bad. Instead, he scooped her up in her arms, carried her inside, laid her gently on the sofa, and said to her, there will be no punishment here. This experience is enough. The second story is told to me by a friend of mine who had a daughter who was struggling in second grade. And one day the teacher pulled her aside and said, you know, you're really good at thinking before you speak. And that turned the daughter's whole year around because what she thought was her awkwardness turned out to be a blessing. And she saw the teacher respected her and she became a self-confident, better student. The third story is from a movie uh, which I hope you've seen, called Goodwill Hunting. And if you've seen that movie, you know Matt Damon plays this math genius who is emotionally troubled, and he, he um, goes to see a therapist played by Robin Williams. And all movie long, we've watched Will Hunting conquer everything. He dominates grad students with his superior knowledge. He dominates mathematicians with his superior math. But Robin Williams sees a weakness in him and brings him out to a park, and they sit on a park bench in front of a lake. And Robin Williams says to him, you're a tough kid. I ask you about the war. You're probably going to show Shakespeare at me, right? Once more into the breach, dear friends. But you've never been near one. You've never held your best friend's head in your lap and watched him grasp his last breath looking up to you. I ask you about love. You'll probably quote me a sonnet. But you've never looked into a woman's eyes and been totally vulnerable, known someone who could level you with her eyes feeling like God put an angel on this earth just for you, who could rescue you from the depths of hell. I look at you, I don't see an intelligent, self-confident man. I see a cocky, scared kid. You're a genius, Will, no one denies that. But I don't give a damn about all that, because I can't learn anything from you that I can't read in some book. Unless you want to talk about you, who you are, and then I'm fascinated. But you don't want to do that, do you, sport? You're terrified of what you might say. So these are three stories. And they're told to illustrate three skills that are essential in our community life, our relational life, and our political life. The first skill is to see with understanding what that father did for that little drunk girl on the porch. He saw the condition she was, he understood what she was thinking. He knew how to make her feel seen and heard. The second skill, what that teacher did, <clears throat> was to affirm with insight to tell someone a compliment about the gifts they have that maybe they don't even see themselves. The third skill is to critique with care. That Robin Williams character, first he showed his love and support for Will Hunting because he saw what Will refused to tell him. He was listening so well that he heard what Will was unwilling to say, which was about his fears and his desire to be invulnerable. But then he doesn't settle for that. He introduces him to a new form of knowledge. Will Hunting thinks book knowledge is the kind of knowledge you have to have to be smart. But Robin Williams says, no, it's experience and it's pain. You can be knowledgeable with other men's knowledge, but you can't be wise with other men's wisdom. And so he introduces him to a new way of thinking, which is to actually live life so you can actually be wise. So these are three skills to see with understanding, to affirm with insight, to critique with care. And I write a lot about community. I write about what academics call social capital. I write about politics. But these are abstract words. What does community really mean? What does relationship really mean? What does politics really mean? It's about human relationship and human connection. And at its most granular level, it's about skills like this. If you can perform these three skills, you'll be a good teacher. You'll be a good leader, a parent, a friend, politician, citizen in your community. Morality is sometimes following commandments, but most of the time morality is a skill, a skill of treating people with consideration. So how good are we at this skill? Well, people have done a lot of research on this subject, and I can tell you, you're not as good as you think you are. There's a scientist named Willie Mickus down in Texas who studies people as they're conversing 
<clears throat> and then figures out how, what they're thinking about, the other person is thinking of them, and how often they are right. <clears throat> the average person is right 20% of the time. A lot of people are right 0% of the time. Superstars are right 55% of the time. And the people who are right 55% of the time and the people who are right 0% of the time have the same level of confidence that they know they're right. <laughs> and the scary fact is that the longer couples are married, the less well they know each other. And that's because when you get married, you fall in love, you study the person you're in love with, and you, get to, you have a model in your head of what they're like. And then decades go by and the other person changes, but you have the old model in your head. And so the ability to know another person actually deteriorates. So how do you get to know another person? Well, sometimes we think I can read another person by looking at their body language. I can tell you that's a myth. <clears throat> you can't do that. Some people think, well, I can be empathetic. I can feel my way into the other person. The other person is too strange for you to do that. That's largely a myth. Perspective taking, I'll walk a mile in their shoes. That's largely a myth. We're less good than we think we are at seeing, what other, and seeing other people and thinking we understand what they're saying. How about as a society, are we good at it? Well, I'm a journalist. I interview dozens of people every week. And if there's one thing I've heard over and over again, it's people who tell me I feel unheard, unseen, invisible. 20 years ago, I would come to the Midwest, and maybe once every three days, I would hear the phrase flyover country. Got to be, by 2016, I heard that phrase six times a day. And so I've come to believe we have an epidemic of blindness in our society. And this is our core problem, that many of our society's great problems flow from people not feeling seen. Blacks feeling that their daily experience is not understood by whites. Rural people not feeling seen by coastal elites. Depressed young people not feeling seen by anyone. People across the political divides looking at each other in blind incomprehension. People at a workplace feel their boss doesn't really know them. Husband and wives in broken marriages realizing the person who should know them best actually has no clue. And so at the core of our political problems and our political divisions and our policy disagreements is a human problem of dehumanization. And it manifests as some sort of spiritual and social crisis. The number of people who say they have no close friends in America has doubled in the last two decades. 54% of Americans say that no one knows them well. The number of adults without a romantic partner has declined by a third. There's been a 73% increase in depression among Americans between 2007 and 2018. Teenage suicide is up 58% since 1999. 27% of Americans are estranged from a member of their immediate family. This kind of social breakdown is at the core of our, what I think of as our core problem, a lack of trust. If you ask people in Denmark, do you trust your neighbors? 75% of Danes say, yeah, I trust my neighbors. If you asked Americans a generation ago, do you trust your neighbors? 60% said, yeah, I trust my neighbors. That was 60% of a generation ago. By 2014, it had fallen to 30%. Boomers, about 40% of us think our neighbors can be trusted. Gen X, 31%. Among millennials and Gen Z, only 19% say most people can be trusted. 73% of young adults said, most of the time, people are selfish and just look after themselves. Imagine going through life with a sense that everybody out there is selfish and out to get you. Our sense of politics and our sense of life depends on how well we feel secure and safe in it. And if you don't feel secure and safe, you revert to tribe, you lash out to enemies. Distrust sows distrust. Distrustful people try to make themselves invulnerable. They armor themselves up in a sour attempt to feel safe. Distrust and spiritual isolation causes people to flee from intimacy, replace it with stimulation. We generalize about each other. We have wars of us and thems. We essentialize spreading these vast generalizations about who we don't like. 
And to me, this is the spiritual and emotional crisis underneath our politics. Benjamin de Israeli, the 19th century story, or statesman, said the spiritual nature of man is stronger than codes or constitutions. No government can endure which does not recognize that for its foundation. No legislation lasts which does not flow from the spiritual nature of man. T.S. Eliot said it's a myth to believe we can design a society so strong that the people in it don't have to be good. My hero Edmund Burke wrote that manners are more important than laws. Upon them the great measure of laws depends. Laws touch us here or there, now and then. Manners are what vex and smooth, corrupt or purify. According to their quality, they aid morals, they supply them, or they totally destroy them. And in my view, though I cover policy and I write about economics, it's the dehumanization that undergirds a lot of what has become a political and policy catastrophe. So how do we get better at seeing other people? Well, it's important first to understand what a person is. You can't see something you don't understand. So let me tell you a quick story to illustrate what a human being is. It's a story set December 26, 2004. It was written by a guy named Emmanuel Carrer in his memoir. Carrer and his girlfriend and their respective sons were vacationing off a cliff hilltop in Sri Lanka. And Carrer had thought this woman he was with named Helene was gonna be the woman of his life. But when they got to Sri Lanka on vacation, they realized they were gonna break apart. He wrote, we were simply watching ourselves draw apart without hostility, but with regret. It was too bad. For the umpteenth time, I spoke of my inability to love. And it was all the remarkable because Helen was truly worthy of love, but I was unable to love. And so they were in a sad, bored mood that morning when they awoke, December 26, 2004, and they decided to cancel the scuba diving trip they had signed up for. And that was a consequential decision in the Pacific because that was the morning the tsunami hit. If anybody remembers the tsunami in 2004. Two days earlier, they had met another French family, Jerome, Delphine, and their lovely four-year-old daughter, Juliette. That morning, Jerome and Delphine went into shopping in the village. Juliette was playing by the waves. Her grandfather was watching her on the beach. Her grandfather was reading the paper and suddenly get, felt himself swept up in a gigantic wall of black water. He had two thoughts. One, I'm going to die. Two, Juliet already has. He gets swept in the land by the water, then it starts receding, and as he's about to be swept out to the ocean, he grabs a palm tree, a fence pins him against the palm tree, he survives. He has to go into town to tell uh, Delphine and Jerome their daughter is dead. He walks toward them, he realizes they're seeing the last moments of pure happiness of their life. He tells them, Correa writes, Delphine screamed, Jerome didn't. He took Delphine in his arms and hugged her as tightly as he could while she screamed and screamed. And from then on, he had only one objective. I can no longer do anything for my daughter, so I will save my wife. Carrere and his family are with Delphine and Jerome for the next several weeks, eating together, hanging out together, looking for Juliet's body. Carrere watches Delphine absorb the blow. He watches how her hand shakes the rare times she's eating when she's trying to put some rice in her mouth. They go around for the hospitals looking for Juliet's body. Helene leaps into action, is helping everybody, providing the caregiving and doing the practical advice, insurance policies. They meet a woman, Ruth, who had lost her husband. She's decided to wait by the hospital and stay up for an entire week, hoping she can see her husband walk alive into the hospital. Carrere writes, her determination is frightening. You can sense she's quite close passing to the other side into catatonia living death, and Delphine and I understand that our role is to prevent this. The weird thing about it is Jerome is on his mission to save his, life, his wife. So at meals, he tries to bear everyone up, to tell them funny stories, to talk loudly, to smoke, to pour drinks, just to keep her from collapsing. Carrere is watching him. He writes, at the time, out of the corner of his eye, Jerome kept watch over Delphine. And I remember thinking, there it is, real love a man who truly loves his wife. There is nothing more beautiful, but Delphine remains silent, absent, and horribly calm. This goes on for a couple weeks, 
and, find, and career is sort of broken open and destroyed by this tragedy they've all lived through. But he had a feeling in the middle of that <clears throat> that this woman, Helene, who he couldn't love, suddenly he does love her. And he writes, I tell myself that this long life together with her must happen. If I need to succeed at one thing before I die, it's this. Helene has the same sense that we were separated, but in those weeks, we were a unit, we were one thing. So they actually do fall in love with each other. They marry and have their own daughter. So what's this story about? <clears throat> First, it's about human solidarity, the essential oneness that binds people to each other in a time of crisis. And it's helpful to remind ourselves of that in a time of political division. Second, it's about doing your job. Jerome has a role as husband to save his wife. He does his job. But the reason I tell this story, it's about the transformation of a consciousness. Before the wave, Carrere's consciousness was a tragedy, a man wrapped inside himself, unable to love. The tragedy breaks him open, carves a floor in the basement of his soul and reveals cavities below. Einstein said, you're not going to solve your problems at the level of consciousness at which you created it. He develops a new consciousness he's able to love. And so the point I want to make out of this story is that the most important thing each of us does is to create a point of view, to create a consciousness. And sometimes that consciousness gets smashed by events. Delphine's consciousness has been smashed. Her sense of herself has been smashed by the loss of her daughter. And so the essential activity of being a human being is involved in this process of building a worldview, building a consciousness, building a subjective process of taking in reality. A person, we sometimes treat each other as objects, but a person is not a thing, a person is an object, is a, per, a person is a process. It's a process of creating a perspective, a point of view, your own way of being aware. Experience is not what happens to you, it's what you do with what happens to you. We're artists of reality. We construct our reality. So as we think about our political divisions and all the ways we categorize people, if we think of each other as creating a perspective, making a movie of our lives, that everyone is making their own movie, we see a human being in the full creativity of living. C.S. Lewis said, if you had never met a human and you met one, you would be inclined to worship this creature because each person you meet is so deep and so complicated and so much is going on in their brain and body. And so when you think about getting to know a person like that, you want to approach every person you meet with respect and reverence. There are two religious concepts, whether you're religious or not, that I think are super useful here. The first is the concept of a soul, that there's some piece of you that has no size, weight, color, or shape, but is of infinite value and dignity. And so when you meet somebody, you're meeting someone with an infinitely valuable soul. The second and related concept is the image of God. Each person is made in the image of God. God is a creator, each of us is a creator. And whether you're religious or not, if you treat people as a soul, and if you look at them and shine illumination onto them with your reverence and respect for each person, you'll probably end up treating them correctly. The second step is a phrase Pope John or Pope Francis uses. The phrase is accompaniment. Accompaniment is a style of being with someone. Most of the time we're not having deep conversations, we're just being with each other. I know a bunch of guys who play basketball every week. They're middle-aged white guys. They probably had never had an intimate conversation in their life with each other. <laughs> but they would die for each other because they've been involved in that basketball game every week. And out of the passes and the joking and the ribbing, bonds have created. It's accompaniment is an other-centered way of being. The third and most important stage in getting to know someone is not empathy. It's not perspective taking. It's not looking. It's listening. Helen Keller said she was deaf and blind. She said it's a lot harder to be deaf than blind. We get more through our ears than we do through our eyes about other human beings. It's the skill, the essential skill of politics, like the essential skill of life, is the possibility of being able to have a really good conversation. And so I go around and thinking about this, and I can tell you in Washington, 
and I cover the Senate mostly, this is an institution that's almost designed to, to make good conversations impossible. The time, the division, the barriers, the resentment, the distrust. So I've been going around to conversation experts asking them how do you have a good conversation? And I've collected what I hope, what I think to me are practical bits of advice. I'll give a few. One, treat attention as an on-off switch, not a dimmer. If you're going to attend to someone, make it all the way, 100% or zero. Don't make it 70%. Be a loud listener. I have a friend when he listens, it's like he's in church, at some Pentecostal church. It's like, uh-huh, yeah, uh-huh. feels great to talk to that guy. Make them authors, not witnesses. When people are telling you a story, most people do not go into enough detail. If you ask them to tell you as a story with the detail, where was your boss standing when he said that? Then they're in the narrative flow. Suddenly you get a lot more. Do the looping. You don't understand what somebody just said as much as you think you do. So summarize and clarify. Keep the gem statement at the center. Whenever you're having a disagreement, there's usually some fundamental thing you actually agree on. My brother and I might fight about the health care our father's getting, but we both care about our father's health. That's our gem statement. Don't fear the pause. When we talk, imagine every answer is like, I start here and then I talk till my fingertips. At one point, have you stopped listening so you can think of your response? Probably about here. Don't worry, listen to the whole comment, then wait four or five seconds. In a serious conversation, a pause can be powerful. And then the final key to a good conversation is asking good questions. This is the essential thing you learn as a journalist. The quality of your questions is the quality of the conversation. Good questions are honoring. When you meet a homeless person, you're tempted to ask them why they're homeless. But you can't help someone unless you make them feel seen. So ask them about their child, a good childhood memory. The easy introductory questions are things like, how'd you get your name? That's a good way to learn about their family background or ethnic heritage. But when you get to know someone and once trust has been established, it's those wide angle questions that really open things up. Those questions that take people above the daily rigor of their lives and lift them up so they can see from a different perspective. A question like that is, what would you do if you weren't afraid? We all know fear governs us at some level. But you step back and think, well, how is fear governing me right now? I asked that question to my students at Yale. And about 10% of them said, if I wasn't afraid, I'd leave Yale. Because <laughs> it's not the right school for me, but I can't give up the prestige. What crossroads are you at? We're all at a moment of crossroads almost at every point in our life, but we don't really stop to think about it. What problem did you used to have that you've now licked? What forgiveness are you withholding? What's a question you have asked yourself that has not gone away? What's a commitment you've made that you no longer believe in? These are big open questions that get people that start an exploration one with another. And if you ask good questions, you never know how deep you're gonna go with other people. I have a friend who teaches seventh grade and she was teaching the students question skills. She said, ask me any question, I'll answer it. These are seventh grade boys. First question was, are you married? No. Are you divorced? Yes. Do you still love him? Tough question. <laughs> she said yes. And if you look at the people in this way, if you accompany them, if you converse with them, you actually can get to know people and make them feel heard and understood and taste what it feels like to have that knowledge of another. I can tell you, I'm not the world's greatest at this, but when you taste it and you've all experienced it, when you really know someone, it's delicious. I was sitting at my um, dining room table a couple years ago now, and I was reading some boring book and I looked up and I saw my wife at our open door and the door was open, the front door, and the light was coming in behind her. And she happened to be looking absentmindedly at this orchid we keep on the table by the door. And I don't know what she was thinking about, but her gaze rested on the orchid. And I had this sensation that I really know her. 
And if you asked me what I was knowing about her at that moment, it was not the biographical details of her. It was not even the adjectives I'd used to describe her. Suddenly, it was the whole flowing of her being, the rise and fall of her moods, the incandescence she broadcasts. In fact, it wasn't even that I was seeing her. It was almost as if I was out seeing through her, seeing from her. I was not investigating her. I was not observing her. I was just beholding her. Uh, and at that moment, I had the sensation I saw with understanding. And it's accessible to us all. The second skill I talked about is to affirm with insight. We all have gifts. Some of the gifts we've inherited from our past, from our ancestors. As a New Yorker, I'm trained to argue all the time. <laughs> As Midwesterners, well, I won't even generalize about what you're good at. <laughs> but these are gifts. Where they've been given to us by our ancestors, certain ways of seeing the world, certain values, certain ways of traveling through life. And then we get our personalities. We don't really earn our personalities. They're given to us by our genes and by our ancestors. Some people are really extroverted. They respond to positive emotions. Some people are conscientious. They really follow rules really well. Some people are neurotic. They respond to negative emotions. These are all gifts. Even being a neurotic is a gift. Neurotic people are very sensitive to threats. And so if you want to be a prophet, if you want to be a creative artist, be neurotic. Helps. <laughs> all of these are gifts. And all of us try to take the gifts we've been given and transform them into legacies that we give others. And so if you watch people in that process of transforming their gifts into legacies, you can really see insight into what they're adding to the world. One of the movies that's about this affirming with insight is It's a Wonderful Life. There's a guy who's about to commit suicide on Christmas Eve because he thinks his life has been a waste. But the angel Clarence comes down says, no, here, I'm going to tell you what your gift has been. And he shows how he's turned Bedford Falls into preventing it from being Potterville. The, Aaron, the Clarence says, strange, isn't it? Each man's life touches so many others. When he isn't around, he leaves an awful hole, doesn't he? And that brings us to the third great task I'll close on, which is to critique with care. Each of us is going through some task at any given moment. It may be the task of career consolidation. It may be the task of intimacy. How do I become intimate with another person? It may be the task of finding a, an identity. I tell my, and if, if you're over 50, it may be the task of how do I give back? I tell adults, you remember that? Or I tell my college students, remember that time around 13, horniness suddenly entered your life? Well, when you hit 55, you develop this horniness for generativity. You get this incredible urge to give back, and you've got to figure out how. And so at those moments of transition, as we switch from one task to another, most of us are struggling. And to offer critique with care is how we help each other along. I read recently about this therapist named Lori Gottlieb, who's out in LA. She had a patient named John, who was a classic self-absorbed narcissistic jerk. He used to clip his fingernails during therapy. He would bring lunch, not for her. <laughs> and she, everyone hates John. He's a narcissistic jerk. But Gottlieb has a voice in her head, have compassion, have compassion, have compassion. She understands somehow intuitively that John is a jerk because something happened to him. And so they get like six months into therapy. He's been a total jerk. But she says, I'm not going to have idiot compassion. Idiot compassion is just accepting and affirming whatever. She's going to push him and push him. And finally, John mentions in a matter of fact tone that when he was 12, his mother was a school teacher, was walking out of school, saw a kid about to get hit by a car, ran to the street, pushed the kid, saved the kid's life at the cost of her own. So she sees, oh, he's got some wounds. His task is to heal the wounds. So they're walking on the wounds, and then six months later, he's talking about his wounds, and John says, and Gabe was getting so emotional. And John had talked about his kids, but he never mentioned Gabe. 
So she stops immediately and she sees this is something. Who is Gabe? He picks up his phone, he walks out of the office, on the way out he said, Gabe was my son. He disappears for six months, never comes back. Finally comes back and she learns that Gabe was six, they were on their way to Legoland in LA. And John got a call, looked at his text, accidentally drove into the other line, Blaine killed Gabe in the car crash. So this guy's task is to recover the grief and discover the emotions he's been shutting out all his life. And it's through her critique with care that she pulls that out of him. So these are not lofty skills. This is not like George Patton going into Germany. This is not Mother Teresa. These are everyday practical skills and they're skills of humanization. And I only talk about them in a lecture allegedly on policy and politics and I have not once mentioned the Congressional Budget Office, I apologize. Because the crisis at the core of our politics is a crisis of dehumanization. And that's not cured by telling lofty stories. It's cured by the daily act of every single American doing practical skills of consideration that make people feel belonged, that make people feel respected, that make people feel safe, that make people feel heard, that they are human beings with dignity. And once that has been reestablished, then safety has been reestablished, conversation has been reestablished, and the art of politics and finding out how to settle our differences becomes possible. Thanks very much. David, that was terrific, um, absolutely terrific. So we have some time together to ask David a few questions, and many of you have sent your questions in advance. So thank you, wonderful audience. Um, but I feel like I need to ask you, um, David, what would you do if you weren't afraid? <laughs> Take off my mask. Um. <laughs> My, my controlling fear, <clears throat> which I hope I'm trying to overcome, is other people. <laughs> so I tell young journalism students, if you're in a football game and everyone else is doing the wave, but you just sit there and don't do the wave, you have the right kind of aloof personality type to be a journalist. <laughs> um, and so a lot of my life has been trying to overcome that aloof personality type. So, David, you know that I'm the director of the LaFollette School of Public Affairs, and part of our mission is to train future leaders. So, in your experience, what are some of the skills that we need to give our next generation of public sector leaders? Yeah, I would say, I would just say what, you know, I was talking, we were with the students today, and I tried to illustrate how policy, where I live, Washington, D.C., is the most emotionally avoidant place on the face of the earth. And a lot of people go into policy because they don't want to think about emotions. And they, they can reduce everything to cost-benefit analysis, which is important. Uh, but, we teach that. <laughs> <laughs> but when I go into White Houses or I go into a Senate office or a House office or a governor or a mayor, it's really the the moral ecology that person has created around them that really matters. And so each person creates a moral ecology. Uh, and so for example, one of my mentors with a guy I hope a lot of people know is Jim Lehrer. Uh, and <clears throat> my first 10 years on the job, Jim Lehrer, he never talked to me about how to be a pundit. But if I said something he liked, his eyes would crinkle in pleasure. And if he said something he disliked, his mouth would turn down in displeasure. And so um, I tried to chase the eye crinkle and avoid the mouth downturn. <laughs> that is how he mentored me. And because he did that, not only to me, to the whole show, everyone had certain standards that we knew we had to live up to. And if you're gonna fail, it should not be because you have an inadequate ideal. 
It should be because someone told you this is how we do the job of being a public servant. Uh, and so I, I ran across a guy who ran a school in Vermont decades ago, and he said our job at our school is to make people who are acceptable at a dance invaluable at a shipwreck. What they meant by that was to create people who are tenacious in a crisis. And so I think even for a public policy school, that's creating that kind of leader. And, you know, it's cheap to say, but character really is destiny. And the way I think universities really create character, but often through the back door. If you're like me, you don't always remember what your teacher said, but you remember who they were. And what a teacher ultimately teaches is himself. And so you see how a person handles knowledge. You see how they welcome you into a tradition of inquiry. You see how they give you something to love. And so what a school like La, Fal La Follette does is it says, here are all these subjects, all these ways to serve. Which one do you fall in love with? And if a school can give you something to love, whether it's economic or the problem, solving the problem of climate change, then you're going to do that for the rest of your life. I have a thing I call the uh, Annunciation Moment after Annunciation Paintings. It's the moment where you first taste something that your whole life is going to re then revolve around. When my daughter was five, she walked into a hockey rink. Twenty years later, she coaches hockey for the Anaheim Ducks. She loves hockey. I read Padding to the Bear when I was seven. I decided at that moment I was going to become a writer. Some people, you know, they come across a problem and the problem just grabs them by the heart. And so if you can introduce people to what they're going to love, that's like the ultimate gift. Amen. So one of our audience members, Jennifer, puts this question to you, David. What advice would you give to someone who can no longer identify themselves with either political party, but who doesn't want to check out of the political and the policymaking process? Jennifer says that these people feel like they belong nowhere. Welcome to my life. Uh, <laughs> yeah, I mean, I, I think what, you know, I began my career as a socialist. If you go on YouTube and you, you Google David Brooks, Milton Friedman, you can see 21-year-old David Brooks debating economics with Milton Friedman. It was a PBS show we did. And the show was basically me regurgitating something I'd read in a textbook and then him destroying it in six words. Um, and then me with my mouth hanging open trying to think of what to say. Um, and so he introduced me to being what a conservative looked like. And then William F. Buckley was my mentor. I became more conservative. And in the 1980s, I was happy being sort of Republican leaning. That began to change with Newt Gingrich. Drifted away from that. But I think what I found very useful is not trying to invent my own wisdom. Like, it, people say you should think for yourself. If you're an Aristotle, you can do that. Most of us can't do that. <laughs> and so I found the North Stars that guide me. And there are two. One is Edmund Burke, who I quoted. And Burke's core philosophy is epistemological modesty. The world is super complicated. You should be very cautious about thinking you understand it. So when you do social change, it should be incremental, gradual, and constant. So I covered, as a young reporter, these, home, these projects in Chicago, Robert Taylor Homes, Cabrini Green. They were built with the best of intentions, but they were disastrous. And so when I covered those projects, I thought, that's what Burke was talking about. Be humble. Then my second hero is Alexander Hamilton, who was a Puerto Rican hip-hop star from New York. <laughs> <clears throat> Uh, and his great theme was using government to give people a chance to rise up and become successful capitalists. So infrastructure projects, Lincoln did this, land-grant colleges. And so Hamilton's here, then the Whig Party starts, and the Whig Party lasts for Lincoln. I think it dies, really, with Theodore Roosevelt. But so Burke and Hamilton are people I fell in love with when I was 25. I re recently went back and read the books I read when I was 25. Still love them. There just doesn't happen to be a political party attached to that philosophy, at least since the American Whig Party died in 1850, whatever, something. <laughs> so there are six of us left. But, um, 
but at least I know where I stand. And I know people say, I don't know what you're going to write, but if you read Edmund Burke and Alexander Hamilton, you would know what I was going to write because the principles are there, and I just try to see how they would apply to our problems today. So one of our La Follette School students posed this is this question. In your book, The Second Mountain, you argue that the most impressive people, the quote, those who radiate joy, end of quote, turn away from their worldly successes and adopt a perspective focused on others. So this student asks, how do you recommend that we do that while navigating the inevitable twists and turns that characterize adulthood? Yeah. Well, so I should be upfront and say, you know, I wrote this book on really d trying to die to self. And so I'm on book tour talking about, you know, forsaking material goals. I'm checking my Amazon rating every hour. So like, <laughs> do as I say, not as I do. Um, I would say you never get over ego. I mean, you never really get over it. But if you, um, and I do know some people who were born, my wife was like this. The, the, the concept of the book was the first mountain is you try to build, you try to make an impact in the world. You try to establish yourself as success. And then a couple things ha are likely to happen to you. One, you achieve your dreams. And that happened to me. I'm way more successful than I ever imagined. And I remember the first time with my first book, I got a call from my agent. I was in LA driving on Sunset Boulevard. And she says, you're on the bestseller list. So that was like a dream come true for a writer. Felt nothing, absolutely nothing. It was just something that happened out there. And so it was weirdly unsatisfying. Or else something bad happens to you, or you fail, or you get fired, and you're in the valley. And I found, at least for me, I needed that valley experience to shake the ego. And whether it's a cancer scare, or in my case, a divorce and a period of suffering, and you, you either break or get broken open. And I found once I could get broken open, believe me, I still wake up thinking about success and all that stuff. But once you've tasted the wine, the bug juice isn't going to satisfy you. Uh, and so I do think it's, it's learning from those process of, of suffering that really changes one's loves. And Plato had this sense, he, what he called the ladder of loves, that if you want to educate a person, introduce them to a beautiful face. And they'll think, oh, that's beautiful, but there's even higher beauty, which is a beautiful personality. And if you see that, oh, beautiful personality, but there's even higher beauty, which is truth. And that's beautiful, but there's even higher beauty, which is justice. And there's even higher beauty in that, which is the beauty of the universe, Plato says, from which nothing can be taken, nothing can be added. That's the transcendent beauty of nature or God. And if you keep your eye on the higher beauty, the lower beauty will seem unsatisfying. And so I think that happens to people as they age. The, some of the lower beauties, like when I was a kid, if you asked me what I wanted, well, I wanted 800 Hot Wheel cars. I no longer want that. I, I don't longer eat orange juice frozen out of the jar. I have hopefully a better taste. <laughs> Uh, and so I think as we age, we, we discover higher loves. And you can't defeat a bad love with no love. You have to defeat it with a higher love. And I, I do think it's that ascension uh, that sort of makes people um, hopefully deeper and better. So Caitlin wants to know, what's the biggest public policy problem out there which nobody's talking about? which nobody's talking about. I wish I knew that guy would write about it. I mean, I, <laughs> um, you know, the obvious, I mean, to me, and this is not something nobody's writing about. I mean, I hopefully, my general perspective tonight is I think something that people aren't trained to write about, which is to connect the policy to the human. And so, you know, the thing, I, the issue I care more, most about is social mobility. I want to create a world where people have more equal opportunities. And so there's a way to think about that in the conventional policy terms. Pre-K education, improving community college, I'm for all that. But how well, you, whether you graduate from college is super predicted by what your attachment style with mom was at 18 months. And so that, that emotional relationship with mom, we don't think about it that much, but it's super important if you want to talk about social mobility. 
Aces. How many adverse childhood experiences have you had? How many, do you see the world as a threatening place to which you put up defenses? Are you avoidantly attached to other human beings? You can't have a relationship that you haven't, someone hasn't given to you. And so if you are avoidantly attached, you haven't been, had a loving mem person in your life, you walk into the classroom, you have no way to know how to use teacher to learn. And so a teacher once described to me an avoidantly attached kid as a sailboat tacking into the wind, wanting to get close to the teacher, not knowing how. And so it is this process of, of moral and emotional formation that is part of the, the policy process of creating social mobility. And so I, I just think of the whole person. And so to me, that, that our core problem is an inequality of income, but also an inequality of opportunity and inequality of respect, which is so corrosive when you feel that other people are looking down on you. And so that's why I come here. I should have talked about, you know, the earned income tax credit. I'm happy to do that. But I emphasize this gushy stuff, this woo-woo stuff, just because I think it's the part we're least comfortable and least equipped to talk about in a way that did not used to be true. I love the gushy stuff, <laughs> and I'm glad you talked about it. So Michael, one of our um, audience, audience members, asks this question. The politicization of the media has allowed large swaths of the public to exist in alternate political realities untied to facts. What actions might citizens take to help us return to a space where a common set of facts guides our political discussions? So uh, I have a friend who uh, he and I disagree about this. Uh, so it's a, he wrote a very, his name is Jonathan Rausch. He wrote a very good book called The Constitution of Knowledge. And it's a book wh about what he calls the epistemic regime. Epistemology is how we come to form knowledge. And he said one of the great things about our country, our culture, our civilization, is that we're heirs to whole systems that try to separate truth from falsehood. And we're sitting in the middle of one. And these are, you know, these universities are amazing universities, like the best the world has ever seen. Uh, and so churning out truth, separating truth from falsehood, and yet somehow people choose alternate facts. And Jonathan says it's because we've given up some of the skills of how to do that, some of the intellectual skills. So for example, one of his rules is no argument from a position of credential. Who you are does not determine the truth of what you say. What you say determines the truth of what you say. And having a good argument about it. I have a friend who says, in the Jewish background, arguing is what we do. Uh, and he says, we're finding the disagreement under the disagreement. When we disagree, it's actually because we disagree on something even more foundational. And if we search down to find that thing, we really have uncovered something important. And that's part of the intellectual process of coming to truth. But in my view, people don't, people believe that, to get a little political, the falsehoods that Donald Trump says, because it's more important to tell a story they relate to than to tell the facts. And he tells a story that they relate to, that those people look down on you, you're being left behind. And if you get your myth right, then the facts will follow. And so to me, it's a question of, how do we find a story as Americans that for once we can all relate to? I think we had a story as a country, which was an Exodus story. We, crawled, we escaped oppression, crossed the, promised land, crossed the ocean, came to the Promised Land. That was the story the Puritans told. James Madison and Benjamin Franklin wanted to put Moses on the great city of the United States because that was the story they told. Every immigrant group has told that story. Martin Luther King told the Exodus story more than he told the New Testament story because he was taking his people on a journey. I talk to my students, they don't believe that story anymore because they think, this isn't the land of milk, honey. This is a land with a lot of racism, slavery, and oppression, and genocide. What are you talking about? And I once told a group of students at Georgetown University this Exodus story, and one of the students said, yeah, that's what white rich men say. <laughs> and I've given up that that's gonna be our story anymore. It's just not what resonates with people. And so we need to find a common story. A, a, group, a nation is a group of people organized around a common story. And so to me, the story is um, partly Lincoln's second inaugural. We're part of a golden experiment and we screwed it up, but we can redeem it. 
It's a redemption story. And if you look at Americans, almost everybody either who immigrated here, lived here originally, or was brought here in chains, they suffered a humiliation and they figured out how to redeem it. So if you look at, say, the black experience, there's a great book um, named The Omni-Americans. And it's about, um, I'm now forgetting the name of the author, Murray, Albert Murray. Uh, and it's about the blues tradition in the black culture. He says, when people swing the blues, they're not avoiding their problems. They're looking directly at their problems and creating a functional and respectful and glorious response. And to me, it's that response to humiliation that defines a country that has been, where almost everybody in it at one point in their family's history has been an outsider and has responded creatively and forcefully to that process. And to me, that's a, an experience that we all share at some point in our backgrounds. And I'm hopeful that there can be a redemption story told about America, because if we don't have a common story, if we don't have common objects, common things to work on, we really do disunite. On that common theme, please join me in thanking David Brooks for being here tonight. Thank you. Thank you. On behalf of the LaFollette School, UW-Madison, thank you, David Brooks. We really appreciate it. Thanks, everyone. Mm -hmm.